Good morning. So, let us continue with uh, our depth first search and uh, and I will also try to do one application right and point out what are all the other applications of depth first search and distinguish between breadth first search and depth first search as search graph exploration methods right. So, let us just go through what I have written here and then uh, I will make, make some minor modifications to make the presentation easy in the sense that whatever modifications that I will make to the code now are only to make the proofs of certain claims that I am going to make easier. Otherwise, whatever I have written here is sufficient and whatever modifications that I am going to make to the code can be inferred from whatever data that I have gathered now. Right? So, remember that I have looked at only first and last and I am keeping track of only visited information. Right? Those are the three arrays that I am keeping track of, but if you recall I am interested in five different arrays. Right? Each of them stores some information about the exploration and you can use all this information to solve so other specific problems, right? other problems. Right? And uh, having captured first, last and visited, I claim that parent and depth I can infer, right? but that will make my presentation much longer. So, what does this basically an algorithm do? Right? It is a recursive exploration of the graph moving from one vertex to another vertex. Right? So, whenever it goes to a vertex, it increases the notion of time. Right? Then it will check whether the vertex has already been visited. If it has already been visited, it will increase the notion of time again, increase this counter of time again and return. One picture that you can keep in mind is that let us say this was vertex V and from vertex V let us say you went and deliberately I am drawing it the upward direction for a reason I will come to that in a minute. Right? So, if you go from vertex V to vertex U and then you find that U has already been visited, a picture that is useful to keep in mind is that when control returns from U it comes back to V that is clear because that is how function calls work. Right? You can also assume that this notion of time that is incremented, this variable time which is incremented is used to keep track of one more edge traversal. Right? So, the edge is actually traversed twice. Right? So, this is a point that you can keep in mind. Right? So, if the vertex is already visited then uh, time will be incremented and control will basically return. Right? If the vertex is not visited, then further exploration from that vertex is initiated after marking that vertex to be visited, associating a notion of first time at which you met, uh, you came to that particular vertex, you add that particular value here right? and then explore the unexplored world which is reachable from this particular vertex that is the whole idea. Right? Conceptually nothing changes, we need to guarantee termination somehow by doing this and then we need to see what are all the other values that we can infer from this calculation. Now to make my presentation easy, I am going to modify this for loop right? and uh, the way I am going to modify it and this is what um, you will find in textbooks also right? for okay, you belonging to adjacency of V for you in the adjacency list of V. Right? I am going to perform a larger number of operations. Right? If u equal to 0, then I will do a certain things. Then I will say parent of u is equal to V and depth of U is depth of V plus 1, right. that is it. Right. And then I do DFS of U. One can make this code much more clean and elegant, right? make it much shorter but my presentation I wanted to make it, I want the presentation to become easier. 
right? All the logical invariants that I want, I want them to become easier. Right? So let's just go back. Let's see what happens here. I basically looked at every vertex in the adjacency list of B, right? And then I just said, okay, let's do a depth first search starting from U. Whether it was visited or not, right? I check once I may in enter the function call corresponding to the vertex U. After entering the function call, right, with argument U, then I check whether it has been visited and so on and so forth. But by doing so, I am not gathering the parent information, nor am I gathering the depth information. Right? Now, in the previous presentation, did I miss something? I claim I did not. I had calculated enough information to get the parent information and the depth information. Right? You will see this when I do the proof. Right? But then, had I, if I do not do this modification, right, observe that I still call depth first search of U. exactly as I call depth first search of u here. Once I enter the for loop, I call depth first search of u surely. Only additional work that I do is I check whether u is already unvisited. If it is unvisited, then I say v is the parent of u, right? And then I say depth of u is one more than the depth of u, right? Two small modifications, redundant actually, right? Okay. Now I want to make some claims about this algorithm. First one, right? The easiest one, right? At the end of DFS, Can somebody complete this for me? It will help me understand what is happening. So, at the end of the depth first search, every vertex has at most one parent. Right? That is obvious because parent is an array, it just contains a single value. If a vertex does not have a parent, then the depth of that vertex is actually equal to 0. Right? This is a very crucial thing. Right? Two, You may not find this in a textbook, but this is a common theme that shows up in analysis of algorithms repeatedly. You can Google the word laminar family and you will find so many different results where the concept of laminar family shows up in analysis of algorithms. Right? So the intervals first of V and last of V form what is called a laminar family. What do I mean by a laminar family? If you take U not equal to V, right, then Either, okay, now I will take a shortcut f of u, l of u, and f of v, r, 1. Please fill in the blank, let me see if you are with me. Don't read, don't worry about the word laminar family. I am defining something specifically. 
saying that if u and v are disjoint, u and v are different vertices, then the two intervals, the two intervals first of u and last of u. So I, I hope you have not forgotten this. See this? When it comes in for the, when a vertex is visited for the first time, that time instant is associated as first of v, right? When all the edges incident on it have been explored, right, and control is returned from all those function calls, then last of v basically says time, the last of v gets the value of time, right, and I think I've forgotten to write return here. So clearly this is a time interval okay, by construction. As you can see, last is greater than or equal to first, right? right? So unless, uh, even if V has one edge incident on it, right? So V is like this, it came this way, it came in at a particular time, let me call that time 15, right? So then for U belonging to adjacency list of V, which means if this guy was u, you would have explored this edge, right? When you explored the edge, you would have incremented time to 16, right? And therefore, last of v will basically be 16, right? So as you can see, first of v is less than last of v. Therefore, it is a sequence of integers that I associate in this particular interval. Therefore, it forms a, you can think of this as a time interval. So now I am saying, I want you to discover a property of these two time intervals. Last of u? No, that I that you cannot tell. Okay, very good. So you are trying to now say more. You are trying to say that last of u, if u is a parent of v or an ancestor of v, then last of u is last of v, that's correct. Can you say, but I want you to capture it in a more nice way, intuitive way, you're right. Okay, so either disjoint or exactly, right? Sub interval of the other, it's not just intersect, right? So the two intervals are either disjoint or one is strictly contained in the other. By this I mean they do not share even a common point. The two intervals do not share a common end point. Right? So meaning f of u will not be equal to f of v because the two vertices are different. How can the first visit time be the same? L of u and L of v are different. How can the last visit time be the same? So therefore, neither of the two boundary points will be the same, right? Or one, uh, or they are completely disjoint intervals. Right? So this is a very very crucial thing. Right? Okay. So what are the conditions under which the intervals are strictly contained in each other? So now let us say something further. What can you say? V is a v is a parent of you. That's correct. V is an ancestor of you. Equivalently, right? V v1 up to u is a path such that, can somebody complete this for me?
I just want you to complete this for me. So we say that if the intervals have a cont strict containment relationship, then B is an ancestor of U is correct. But I just want you to see a bit more. What you said is correct. But I want you to state a bit more of what you have seen, right? Because no, just the path. I want you to say V, V1, V2 up to let us say VR. No, it's a, it's a simple, it's a path, right? Well, actually the answer is very easy, right? Uh, again, I'm going to take a shortcut. P stand now stands for parent. Parent of U is equal to VR. Parent of VI is equal to VI minus 1 and parent of V1 is equal to V. Right? In the traversal sequence, this is very crucial. Right? And because just after parent has been set, depth has been set in the code, that is why I wrote the code in this fashion. Right? Just because just after the setting of the parent, the depth has been set and the parent information never changes in the code because this is the only place where the parent value has been assigned. Right? It also means that depth of u is depth of vr plus 1 and so on and depth of v1 is equal to depth of v plus 1. is equal to the depth of V plus 1. So all this you will find in the standard textbook. It's just probably my reasoning by, re by organizing the code in a certain way right, is much uh, simpler. Right. Observe there are certain properties that I have implicitly used which I have not written down. I have observed that once the variable gets a value, once these array, array entries get a value, those values do not change at all. This is a very crucial property. This is what program analysis does? You look at the text of the program and then you write some properties, right? So that once parent has been set, it never changes, right? So one depth has been set, it never changes because once it is set, immediately after the visited becomes one and if you go to the code where visited is equal to one, none of these variables are changed. If visited is equal to one, no data item is changed. The only time the data value changes is when the visited of a vertex is equal to 0. And just after it has been set, once any data item has been changed, in the next recursive call, right, visited will change to 1 and subsequently visited for a vertex never changes to 0. So the variables never change the values. So therefore, once a parent is fixed, the parent is fixed, never changes. Once the depth value is given, it remains the same throughout the execution of the algorithm very crucial properties, right? very simple but crucial properties. Right? Right. Okay. So now we have already said what is the ancestor and so on. Right? Okay. So now So what can you say? If the two intervals are disjoint, that's not correct. That's why. So basically, he says no path can exist. Right? I don't know what he means, but the sentence is immediately wrong because look at this graph. This is A, this is B, this is C, and this is B. Right? So let us associate the intervals with each of these vertices. Right? A is discovered at time 1, right? B is discovered at time 2, right? B is finished at time 
right. So, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, right. So, b is finished at time 3, right. So, then 1 is finished at time 4, right. And then at time 5, right, you will start c, right. And then you will come here, right, that will be time 6 and time 7 you will finish c again. You can see 2, 3 and 5, 7 are disjoint, right, but there is a path between 5, 7 to 2, 3. So, yeah. what you can say is that they do not have a common ancestor. Can you say that again? Let us go through the code, let us go through the code. Good question. And to go through the code, we need to start here, right. So, time is a global variable, right. So, when this loop is run, right, at some point of time visited of C, right, is here, then DFS of C will start, right. So, when DFS of C starts, first of all time then gets set in our example to 5, it is not visited, so it is set to 1, 5 is the first time at which it is visited, right. Then I inspect the adjacency list, right. What is in the adjacency list of this vertex? Definitely B is there, right. So, therefore, this for loop will pick B, it will see visited is 1, right. So, therefore, it will not execute this these two it would not execute, but it will do DFS of B. But now let us see what happens. At DFS of B it will increment time to 1, from 5 it will become 6, but visited of B is equal to 1, so none of this code will be evaluated. So then time will become 7, right, and it will return, it will return to where this function call DFS of C, right, and therefore Five seven is the interval associated with C. Yeah. No, you could not have gone to C. No, because the edge is coming inwards. That's why yesterday while presenting, I said whatever I am presenting holds for both directed and undirected graphs. And when I needed to say state specific properties of undirected graphs, I said for undirected graphs. Similarly, here. At the moment, I have not assumed anything about directed or undirected graphs, right. At some point of time, I am going to make the distinction, but as of now, I could not have gone from C to B. I hope I am not making a mistake. Yeah, go ahead. It is a directed path or undirected path? Undirected path, okay, fine. Yeah, 3 is the root, right. So, so let us see, right. So, I start at 1, right, then this is at 2, right, then this is at 3, right. At 4, I go on this edge, I realize that 2 is visited, right, I come back, right, then I say 4 closes, right, then I return here, when I return it increases to 5, right. So, then I have come here at the fifth time, then, then I see, then I see that uh, 3 is here, right, that is a 6th time instant, right, yeah. And then I close, so then it comes to, at the 6th time instant this closes, then at the 7th time instance I am back at 3, right. So, then I see that 4 is there to be visited, right. Then uh, I make the parent of, of course I did not mention this, the parent of 4 will become 3, right, depth of 4 will become one more than the depth of 3, that will be 1 now, right. Then the time is in, then it is symmetric, no? Now, what is your question? Oh, I see. Yeah, 
Oh, so what you're asking me to do is, if I look at this interval and this interval. Pardon? Yeah, 2 and 4, they have a common. No, 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 no. No, you're right, you're right. The sentence is wrong for sure. Let me not delete it, let me keep it there and let me state it correctly. I guess it's not possible to make a single statement. There are two possibilities, right? So please pay attention. I made a mistake, but I think inside that mistake there is a uh, there is something instructive here. I think that I cannot write a single statement. I think there are two possibilities when they are disjoint, and let me state them. Hopefully, this is not a mistake, right? So a. So let's see if this is correct, right? So both the possibilities are there on the screen, right? Both the examples are in place, right? So observe that these two intervals, right? They uh, are disjoint, right? And observe that uh, they don't have a common ancestor. Remember my definition of ancestor, right? is not the presence of the z, but my definition of the ancestor is based on the parent relationship, right? So one should not get misled that there is this edge and therefore C is the ancestor of A is not the correct information, right? Okay. So therefore B and C don't have a common ancestor. The other possibility is this example where 2 and 4 have a common ancestor which is 3 as friend here pointed out, but observe that there is no other path from 2 to 4. Right? I mean, I have to be very careful when I make the statement in the in the undirected graph. Right? There is no path from u to v other than and this would be a path when the graph is undirected. If the graph is directed, then this will not be a path. Okay. I hope it doesn't become very bad.
So, let me for now just uh, put a stop to this slide, right. I have a different set of logical assumptions. I will present them which are independent of this and then let us see what I am going to get for this guy, fine. So, just for now let us stop uh, considering the case when the two intervals are disjoint. We have observed some properties, but the properties are not exhaustive, right. So, therefore, I must be attempting something too complicated here. So, let me just stop. Let us move to the ones which are more clearly provable and we will come, come back to this if necessary at all. So, again as you can see I have an algorithm and I am looking for properties, right, trying to make some logical statements, right, and based on all the data values that I have calculated, right. So, now what do I do? I, I take z to be all those vertices whose depth is equal to 0, right, and uh, for each of those vertices. for each v in z, I am going to consider what I call c of v. c of v in my mind stands for closure of v or the component of v, right, which is all those vertices which are a descendant of v, right, which means that I have a sequence of uh, children, right, in starting from v and they are all reachable, fine, okay. okay. So, now let us observe certain properties. A, right. What can you say about the intersection of C of U and C of V? So, they are obviously empty, right. It is a very immediately observable property, right. The second observation that we can see, right, is that is equal to empty, right. And because these are, right, so for again for u not equal to v in z, for u not equal to v in z, right. Now, let us observe a few other properties, right. And these properties are classification of edges. first classification of the edges are that So, for edges for which the depth of V equal to depth of U plus 1, right, and 
parent of V is equal to U are called tree arcs. So, what is the, I mean I am sure you can just visualize this, so let us draw this graph, right. So, if you say A, B, C and D, right. So, this is a tree arc, this is a tree arc and because I drew this as an undirected graph to start with C, D is also a tree arc, right. So, the level 0, level 1, sorry depth 0, depth 1, right, depth 2, depth 3, right. But this arc, right, is not a tree arc, right, because there is no parent relationship between A and D, right. There is only an ancestor relationship between A and D, it is not a parent relationship, neither is there a relationship between D and A because of the visitedness, A is visited before D, right. 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 So, one more thing, if U and V if u and v are in the same z z c z for some okay let me see w for w in z. So, what is the picture here is w and you have done all kinds of traversal these are all the tree arcs right and so on. I am looking at one pair u and v right. So, where such that V is a descendant of U and and V U is an edge. So, what do I mean by this picture? So, here is the search, right? U was visited, then V is visited here, right? At some point of time, if this edge V U is seen, right, then this is called a back arc, right. Just nomenclature, but we will, we will extract some structural properties out of this nomenclature, right. So, what are the crucial things here? U and V are there, right. V is a descendant of U, right, which means you start from V and you have come here, right. And then you encounter, during the search, you have encounter this arc V U, right. So, what is the property of this arc? The the depth of V, right, is greater than the depth of U, such an arc you find, right. So, then clearly, right, so this arc has been explored after first U was encountered, then V was reached from U and then this edge was encountered. So, this is actually witnessing a cycle. So, therefore, U V back arc if and only if right and And let us see what this means. Recall this actually meant sequence of vertices V1, V2, Vr, U, right, and then V. Right. 
So I removed the reverse direction because I want to state it more correctly. What I had written was wrong, right? If C is a cycle, implies one of the edges is the backup. I won't prove this, right? I'll show you the simple case and I'll show you the mo slightly more complicated case. In both the cases, you will be able to visualize that whenever you see a cycle in the graph, the cycle is witnessed by a back arc. We will use this property again, right? right? So let us draw the graph, right? So let us say this is a cycle, A, B, C and It's a directed cycle, I am not assuming any undirectedness, nothing, right? So now, at some point of time, right? So the depth first search will visit A first, right? And then if it visits this edge B, then if it visits this edge C, then if it visits this edge D, right? Then clearly D A is a back arc by definition because the sequence in which I spoke it, right? I said that this is a tree arc, this is a tree arc, this is a tree arc, right? And this is a back arc. But it is quite possible that the following traversal might have happened by the graph. It might have gone like this, like this, it might have gone like this, right? Like this, then it might have gone like this and like this and then this. This is still a back arc, though the tree arcs are this fellow, this fellow, this fellow, this fellow, this fellow, this fellow. Then I need to have some nomenclature for these arcs, right? I'll come to that nomenclature in one minute. So let me draw this picture clearly again, right? So here is what the cycle looks like, A, B, C, D and E. And this is a directed cycle. So I am claiming that, right, one of these arcs will definitely be a back arc, right? So in particular, we will see in the example that I do that definitely D A will be a back arc, right? Why? So let us say this is the first vertex visited in the cycle. This is the second vertex visited after A has been visited in the cycle, does not matter whichever way, which means that the depth of B will be more than the depth of A, the depth of C will be more than the depth of B, the depth of D will be more than the depth of C, right? And this arc will match the definition of a back arc, right? The definition of a back arc is they are in the same component C of W and one is a descendant of the other, then you find this arc, right? So that arc is a back arc. Right? So, that whenever there is a cycle, there is a back arc. When you see a back arc, you have seen a cycle. Right? This is a crucial thing. One back arc may represent multiple cycles, but for every cycle, you will find one back arc. Right? So, that allows us, that draws us to one more concept. is called a forward arc, right? right? Typically a forward arc intuitively gives you multiple paths from to go from A to B. So this is one path and this is another path, right? But it is different from a tree arc, right? So there is one more edge which will, right? And that is the last one.
called a cross arc. Right? I mean, of course, I have to give you applications for each of these, right? But except for cross arc, right? And forward arc, I will give you an application by working in the world of undirected graphs shortly, right? So, but once you do a DFS traversal, right? Based on the depth number that has been given to the vertices, right? And whether two vertices are in the same component, that is whether they have a descendant relationship between the two of them, you can classify all the edges into four categories. Tree arcs, back arcs, forward arcs, and cross arcs. Cross arcs are arcs that go from separate components, that is which do not have an ancestral descendant relationship and are going between the two of them. So, let us draw this. So, which of these are tree arcs, which of these are forward arcs, which of these are cross arcs? You cannot answer the question without doing a traversal, that is why I deliberately ask the question, right? So, whenever you see such a question, right, whenever you see a graph, if you want to answer this edge classification, the classification depends upon the traversal. Different traversals will give you different, will put edges in different classes. This is an important thing to keep in mind, fine, right? So, you start from here, right? So, let us say this is a tree arc. I will just give the depth number 0, 1, then this is 2, right? Then this is 1, right? So, in which case, this is a tree arc, this is a tree arc this is a tree arc, right? But this arc, right, is not a tree arc for sure, right? Fine? Fine? Yeah, so I have to modify my definition of cross arc. It is not a back arc either, that is also for sure, right? Now, therefore, it is neither a tree arc it is not a back arc, it is also not a forward arc because these two vertices do not have the ancestor descendant relationship, right? So, therefore, this should also be treated as a cross arc, right? I have to update the definition of cross arc in a minute, I will go back to it, right? In this part, it is quite easy now. So, this is again level 0, level 1, level 2, right? Then level 1, right? So, this arc is a cross arc this arc is a cross arc, this is a tree arc, this is a tree arc, this is a tree arc and this is also a cross arc, fine, right? fine. So, once you do your breadth first search, you have to basically look at ancestor descendant relationships, right? Edges which are of the form parent child are tree arc, edges which are between an ancestor and a descendant and oriented from the ancestor to the descendant are forward arcs. Edges that are oriented in the opposite direction from ancestor to descendant are called back arcs. All the other edges are cross arcs. So, that makes my life easier, right? So, Actually, this is all the whole information 
that is available from a depth first search traversal. Right? Now what I am going to do is I am going to work on one application. in undirected graphs and this is also there in the tutorial sheet does G have a bridge. So, this is one significant application, this is a very simple first step of the kind of information that you can extract from depth first search and uh, if time permits, we will also do one another simple extension of this algorithm to discover additional properties. Right? Okay. So, let us before we define a bridge, let us observe for undirected graphs right? only tree arcs and forward arcs, sorry only tree arcs. and back arc. You will never have a forward arc or a cross arc. Let us write down the logical reason, right? Either This, this possibility is very clear to you, right? You look at a particular edge and you do the thought experiment. You can say that this edge is visiting, is being traversed for the first time, right? Bringing me from U to V. This is a possibility. That is, this edge is being considered for the first time and it brings me from U to V, which means V is being visited for the first time and U is its parent. This is one possibility. Let us consider that this is not the possibility, right? That when the edge is being visited for the first time, the parent child relationship, right, does not exist, right? Then what could happen? So, let us see, right? So, remember when I say the edge is considered the edge is considered inside that for loop which is inspecting the adjacency list of a particular vertex, right? So, let me draw this edge, right? So, this is the edge uv, it is being considered, right? Now, when it is being considered, right, the That is what I said, right? In the first case, I said that when it is being visited for the first time, V is a child of U. That is one possibility, right? Let us assume this possibility does not happen and let us write it down. When the edge is considered, turns out that the end point of V is not a child of U. What is the meaning of it? Let us see, right? So, U is here, right? And you are looking at the adjacency list of U and you are considering the edge V. And it turns out that V is not a child of u, which means visited of v is already 1, right? If the visited of v is already 1 and it is an undirected graph, right, which means that u and v are in the same component, it is an undirected graph, right? The key property of them is if u and v are adjacent, C of u for some w. This is the difference between an undirected graph and a directed graph. I am not completely proving this, right? but intuitively you can see this. If you have an edge u and v and it is an undirected graph, both of them are in the same C of w for some w whose d was 0. Remember C of w for some w for which 
right, which means they are descendant. So, what does it look like, right? W is here, U is a descendant, right, and V is a descendant. At some point of time, you see you have come to U, and then you are looking at this edge, and then you realize that V is not my child, which means that V has already been visited. If V has already been visited, right, so then the only possibility is that V is a ancestor of U. Right? V is not a child of U implies V is an ancestor that means right, even if you do not completely get this argument of mine because there are some gaps in my whatever I said, right, I have to say a few more points. Right, the edges of the tree are only of edges of the graph, undirected graph are of only two types. They are either tree arcs or they are back arcs. The other two categories do not exist for undirected graphs. Right. So, this is a very crucial point. Right. So, now let us just define a bridge and let us see how to discover if the graph has bridges. So, this is the definition of a bridge, I am defining it using the concepts of depth first search, shortly I will define it using the concepts of graph theory, you may already know this, right. So, but because I want to use depth first search, right, I am going to define it using the concepts that I have set up in the world of depth first search. I say that UV is a bridge, if I look at the graph G prime, which is the same vertex set, but I just remove that one particular edge UV. And then I say that this is a bridge if u is reachable from a vertex called w1, v is reachable from a vertex called w2, but w1 and w2 are different, right. So, pictorially what is this? This is the graph g prime, right, u is here, v is here, this graph Right, it's just one component. Everybody is reachable from a vertex called W2. This is just one connected one component. Right, everybody is reachable from this vertex called W1. Right, this is the graph G prime. How do I get G from here? By just putting back this edge. Right, this edge is called a bridge. Many of you may know this immediately in graph theoretic terms, it is that edge whose removal disconnects the graph, such an edge is called a bridge, right. That is the graph theoretic definition, but I have deliberately written it in the framework of depth first search, because I want to show you a depth first search algorithm for recognizing whether an edge is a bridge or not, right. So, let me write down bridge. I say that an edge is a bridge in the graph G, if removal of that edge from the graph ensures that U and V are not connected. There is no path between the two of them. Earlier there was just a path which was just this edge. Once I remove this edge, there is no other path between the two of them. This is the 
graph theoretic definition, right? But now the question is, given an undirected graph, I want to design an algorithm to answer this question, right? And I want to do it efficiently. How would I do this efficient? How would I do this inefficiently? Let us do this first, and then quickly go to the efficient algorithm. Again, everything that I am stating is in terms of the data that I have gathered by doing a depth first search, right? So what do you do? You want to check whether the graph has a bridge or not. And I also want to count all the bridges. So what do I do? I repeat the following three steps for each edge E. I remove the edge E from the graph. That's the first step. Then I run a depth first search. After running the depth first search for every vertex, I promise you that we would have calculated this interval f of u, l of u, f of v, l of v. We already discussed that if two vertices do not have an ancestor descendant relationship, then the two intervals are disjoint. So just check if they are disjoint, if the two intervals are disjoint. If the two intervals are disjoint, then E is a bridge, otherwise E is not a bridge. Fine. So immediately follows from applying depth first search m times. Why is it inefficient? We do too many DFSs, one per edge. So, running time is number of edges, which is m, multiplied by time for one DFS. I haven't analyzed the time for a DFS. I'll come to that in a minute. The undirected graph, yes. Remember what the way we do DFS is that outer loop is there. DFS is always run like this, right? I mean, if you have to think of DFS correctly, then it basically runs like this. There is an outer visited array, right? You iterate over that array. Whenever you find that a vertex is not visited so far, you start a DFS from there. That is a full DFS. Yeah, obviously. That's, I mean, that is, when I think of DFS, I do not think of DFS at a single vertex. I think of this visited array right? and I think of the full graph traversal by iterating over every vertex in the visited array and call DFS. This is what I mean by saying complete your full depth first search. So you are saying whether it is a bridge or not, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So let us say I remove this vertex. I, I remove one edge. I remove one edge in the path. 
So every edge is a bridge in the path, right? You had a cycle earlier, yes. So there is no bridge in the graph. Yeah, I remove the z. This is u v. The interval of u and v will have ancestor descendant. They will be contained in each other. They will never be disjoint because this is a connected graph. But uh, it depends on what, uh, from what point of view I start BSS. Oh, I see. Because if I start from BSS from the middle vertex, then u and v are not uh, Yeah, so let me complete this because again I have to use the property of an undirected graph, sorry. No, you can start it from anywhere, okay, okay. So actually I will make my life easier, you are right. Maybe his idea is easier to fix the problem that you have raised. So what he says is, uh, DFS G after removing E, right, start. So therefore, this is m multiplied by the total number of depth first search. What I want to try and do now right, is to identify all bridges using one depth first search. So let me give you the intuition and then try to formalize the whole thing. So let me look at one particular edge, right? Okay, first of all, If an, it is an undirected graph and it is a bridge while doing depth first search in the graph, right? right? Then that edge must be a definitely a tree arc, right? So let us see why. The graph looks like this and this is a bridge. Once I remove this, the graph is disconnected into two components. U is in one component, V is in the other component. Then obviously when I do the depth first search from whichever vertex, right, this edge will be the edge which brings uh, the traversal to the end point for the first time. Therefore, this will always be a tree arc. If an edge is a bridge, that is its removal disconnects the graph, then it is a tree arc. That is while the breadth first search is happening, depth first search is happening, right? When this edge is traversed, one of the vertices is traversed for the first time, visited for the first time, right? So in, in other words, in any DFS, when bridge is considered for the first time, The other vertex is visited for the first time. Equivalently, it is a tree arc, right? right? 
Right? So let us say the edge is uv, this is the bridge. Right? When the bridge is considered for the first time, let us say at u, then the other vertex is v, then v is being visited for the first time, therefore uv is a tree arc. Right? Therefore, by after doing a DFS, I only have to worry about the tree arcs and figure out whether they are bridges or not. Right? So let us do that. But I do not want to do another DFS, I want to use the information calculated during the DFS to answer this question. Right? So how would I do this? Right? So step 1, do a DFS, 2, consider each E a tree arc right? and then I am going to maintain some statistic. Let us see what the statistic is going to be. So let us say this is the tree arc. Right? Now we make one small observation. This is a bridge if and only if there is no back arc. So let us say these are all the descendants of V, right? And what you have is the ancestors of U. Somehow if I can cleverly check if there is a back arc that goes from a descendant of V to an ancestor of U, then I immediately know that this is not a this is not a bridge, right? So that is basically my logic, right? And somehow I want to do calculate this without doing one more depth first search, right? So check for an edge x, y where x is a descendant of v. and y an ancestor of u and x, y a back arc. Well, that is a bit redundant, but you can say it and x, y a back arc. If you do not find this, he is a bridge. So therefore, the key things to capture now are somehow I have to find out right, whether there is an edge, there is an edge between a descendant of V to an ancestor of U. Right. But I do not want to do the traversal again. Right. So how does one achieve this? Hmm? Yeah, but which time interval will you check?
So let us try this. Right? Not sure if this will work. Right? So I gather statistics for every back arc. Right? So what do I do for every vertex? For each vertex V, after doing the depth first search, right, I know the classification of the arcs into tree arcs and back arcs. Right? I track the back arc x comma y such that depth of y minus depth of x is the maximum. Let us see if this idea works. think this idea will work. I calculate this, right? Or rather, and So let us think of the intuition, okay? So here is all the tree arcs in the undirected graph. So let us say these are all the tree arcs, right? It's an undirected graph. Let's say it is a tree. This is what a tree arc is. I look at this vertex. This vertex asks, among my ancestors, does anyone have a bridge to me? That is what this guy wants to know. Right? So, he wants to know whether there is one bridge among its ancestors, meaning that if that bridge is broken, this fellow is disconnected from its ancestors. This is the picture that this fellow has in his mind. This is what I have in my mind and I want to somehow capture this information. So I ask, if there is no bridge among my ancestors, then I should somehow have some way of some sequence of back arcs, maybe one back arc which goes like this, then one back arc which, which goes like this, then there is no bridge. Somehow I want to capture this information. For every vertex, I want to see the back arc which goes the furthest to its, among all the back arcs, you keep track of the furthest ancestor to which it has a back arc. For every vertex, I keep track of that information. Meaning, let me draw this better. So maybe for this vertex, there is one back arc here, there is one back arc here. Then I will remember at this vertex, this ancestor. Meaning that if I need a direct connection to some ancestor of mine via a back arc, this is the furthest ancestor that I can go to. Then I will ask all these guys. With which ancestors do you have your furthest connection, furthest back arc connection? If all of them give a number which is below this, then I know that this tree arc is a bridge for me. Right? Let me repeat this. Right? So the tree traversal, the tree arcs are all there. You got it in depth first search time, you got it. We also observed that if there is a bridge, it must be a tree arc, right? So we want to find whether there is a bridge, which is a whether one of the tree arcs, whether it is a bridge in the graph or not. How are we going to find this information, right? Every vertex, now first thing that we observe is that when is this fellow a bridge? Let us say one tree arc is a bridge. When is a bridge? When is it a bridge? Which means if I remove this,
when I remove this, the descendants do not have a way of going to the ancestors at all, right? But how could the descendants have gone to the ancestors only via back arcs or by using the sequence of tree arcs, but I cut this tree arc. Therefore, every descendant keeps track of the highest ancestor that it has a back arc to, right? So therefore, track for each V This is very well defined step. So let us say every vertex has now captured that information. That is easy to do. You can calculate it while the depth first search is happening. Just after you have finished, you only have to look at all the edges incident on you one more time, look at which of them are back arcs and keep track of the largest fellow. That is while doing the depth first search itself, I can modify the code to compute this information. Right? So let me go to that particular code. So inside this loop, right, as I go over the adjacencies, at the end, before I return, right, which would be here, just before this step, I will do one more calculation. I will run through all the edges incident on me. I will check whether it is a tree arc or a back arc. If it is a back arc, I will keep the fellow which is the least ancestor, I mean the number whose depth is the least. That vertex I will track by adding one more for loop here, right? That will increase the running time only by a little bit more. We will see that in a minute. Okay. So once this, now I assume that this information is computed. So which means, I have, under, I have underlined two things. Now, here is a second effort. So what will I do? I will look at each back arc now. Inside this back arc, I will ask this question. So this is a back arc, let me give names. Let us say this is X and this is Y. This is a back arc, which means there is a tree path. Somehow, I will quickly find out whether there is any one guy whose highest ancestor is greater than, has a depth which is lesser than x. So I will ask, okay, tell me who is your highest ancestor. Tell me who is your ancestor whose depth is the smallest possible, right? Even if one guy tells me that I have an ancestor who is here, then what do I know? I know that this edge is not a 
bridge. Right? So let us do this. So again the tree arc is very, the tree structure, the sequence of tree arcs is very crucial. Right? I am interested in this tree arc. Right? Let us assume that there is this back arc. This back arc asks all these vertices, all of you tell me, right, your ancestor whose depth is the least. So, x is here, y is here, yx is a back arc. Consider that special cycle, remember, which is x, tree arcs, y and the back arc y x, right. Compute max overall W which is here, ancestor of W, right. If this is lesser than B of X, then parent of x, x is not a bridge right. So, let us understand the logic here. I am interested in this edge x and parent of x. I find this back arc. I ask each one of them, tell me something about your back arc which goes to the ancestor whose depth is the lowest. This fellow will give one number, this fellow will give one number, this fellow will give one number, right. You take the minimum of all of them. Once you have taken the minimum of all of them, you ask whether that number is smaller than the depth of x. If the answer is yes, if, the, if it is smaller than the depth of x, then you know that the parent of x comma x is not a bridge for any of these guys because from any one of them has an edge which goes at least as high as this. Therefore, by removing this, you cannot disconnect, right, the ancestor and the parent of x and this, right, because So therefore, this is not a bridge for these vertices. Of course, it might actually be a bridge for some something else, right? It, that is quite possible, but definitely for this, not for this. Why am I setting it up like this, right? Now the running time is just going to be, right? The total number of back arcs multiplied by the time to answer this question. So what is the total time for answering this question? I did one depth first search, right, plus sum over all E back arcs, right. Every edge I can keep this information whether it is a tree arc or a back arc. So, for every edge I can inspect whether it is a back arc or not and then, right, I want to answer this question.
find the highest ancestor efficiently. So, but what is the highest ancestor efficiently? You find this as you run your depth first search itself. You have captured the highest ancestor information for each of these vertices. That is already done. So, therefore, the time that this guy has to spend is only to take all the edges which form this tree arc, right, and calculate this, right. So, in the interest of time, I will just skip this part. And I will promise you that this whole thing can be done in one more DFS. Right? Yeah, if I do it not very cleverly, right, then I will have to do a lot of work. But if I calculate one more piece of information, I can extract this minimum very efficiently right and I can avoid a lot of recomputation here. So, it will essentially be yeah, I do not know how to say this in the time available, but let us take this as a promise. Therefore, the time taken for checking whether there is a bridge or for that matter counting the total number of bridges is one depth first search plus the summation over all back arcs, right, finding highest ancestor. For each of them, right. If each of them find an ancestor which is larger than, highest ancestor which is larger than the tail, that is for every back arc that you see here, if, if this cycle tells you that I have an edge which is going to somebody before and if all of them say that, then there is no bridge in the graph. Therefore, that is the only question that I need to answer and the promise is that this can be done in just two depth, the time taken is two depth first search times, fine. Okay. So, I have still not told you how to calculate the time taken for a depth first search, that is easy, I will do it at the end, but let us just summarize what have I done, right. One. Keep track of parent information, depth information, right. Sorry. So, if you keep track of this information, right, this is the first step, this is what is computed by DFS. Then you can extract an edge classification into tree arcs, forward arcs, cross arcs and back arcs, back arcs and cross arcs. In undirected graphs, you just get only tree arcs and back arcs. Then you can compute slightly higher order additional information right. This is one piece of information. The second piece of information is for each back arc. the highest ancestor for each back arc, the highest ancestor for each vertex in the cycle formed by the back arc.
is no bridge. Right? So, the additional information that you compute from here is that for every vertex you compute the highest back arc. This you can do while you do the depth first search itself. Then for every back arc, you look at the cycle. So, this is a back arc, these are the descendants. You ask for the highest back arc from each of these vertices. Right? If it turns out that the highest back arc is higher than this edge, then you know that this one is not a bridge for these vertices. For if every back arc, if this number turns out to be lesser than, then you know there is no bridge. Otherwise, you will capture every bridge as you do this. That you can do in two DFSs. Okay. So now let's quickly finish one DFS running time. Right? It is time to update visited. That is n plus four times number of edges. Remember that every edge is probed exactly four times. How do you know that? Because time is incremented every time an edge is probed. How many times an edge is probed? U is here. This edge is probed once. Time is incremented at that time. Then when the function call returns from here, it increments time once. Right? So that is two times. But this vertex also will probe u once, time will be incremented once, but it will discover this is visited, so it will return here. So time is incremented for every edge four times. So therefore it is four times the total number of edges. Right? So therefore the running time is n plus four times the total number of vertices. Yeah, so I think I have done a very fast treatment of the application of breadth first search. But if you remember this slide, you can work out everything now. I have given all the steps that you need to and the most crucial thing is this additional information. I mean if you want to take a small analysis exercise, this additional information can be computed in time which is exactly the time of depth first search. One more depth first search or while doing the depth first search itself, this information can be computed. Right, and you will basically be done. Right? Okay, so I'll stop here. So again, all this is there in CLRS in the chapter on depth first search, and this is the first example I think in the section. So you should just read it up. Okay, so thank you for your patience. Bro.